Before the web became the all-conquering technology that it is now, to the point where many people don't really draw the distinction between the internet and the web, another now almost forgotten technology was poised to take the role that the web eventually did. We're talking about Gopher, a bold attempt to organize and make visible all the information on the internet, as long as that information was in text form. But before we get into all the delightfully nerdy detail of Gopher, I should say this video is sponsored by PCBWay. Fine purveyor of printed circuit boards. Yes, you design your PCB, you upload it to their website, you give them money, PCBs come back in post. And as I recently discovered that my postman actually watches these videos, I'm happy to keep him in work by moving PCBs around the world. So back to Gopher. For the beginnings of Gopher, we're going to have to go back to the very early 1990s. In fact, 1990. The internet exists, but it's very, very different to how we experience it now. For a start, it's almost exclusively something that's at universities, maybe the odd research or computer corporation, but most businesses don't have the internet. Most people at home don't have the internet. In fact, even amongst the most nerdy of computer users at home that have their own modems, they still tend not to be on the internet. They're using things like bulletin boards or dialing into commercial operations like CompuServe or Prestel. And while some of these systems offer gateway services to stuff like FTP, they don't really directly connect you at home to the internet. You don't get an IP address. The kinds of machines we're also accessing the internet on, very different back then. The PC is still very heavily DOS based, and even at universities when they're networked, they're typically networked not using IP, but IPX and netware. No, the internet users are all either on terminals plugged into mainframes and VAX clusters, or they're on Unix workstations. And this means that all the early internet stuff is heavily text based, as a lot of people on the internet are, well, on a device that only does text, i.e. a terminal. The main protocols we have running on the internet are things like SMTP, POP and IMAP for being able to send email between servers or download them into your own client or access them off a remote mail store. FTP for transferring files between machines. Usenet so we can access news groups. Telnet for logging in between machines. None of these services really has a graphical front end of any description and they're also all in no way connected to each other. If you want to FTP down a particular farm, you have to know which server it's on, which directory it's in and go get it yourself. If you want to access the library's book catalogue in your university, well, you need to know where to tell that to, which machine and which port. Now, you would get organisations that would literally publish a directory of FTP sites, for example, in a, you know, book. But clearly there's an issue here. None of this stuff is discoverable. It's very hard to find things, and they're also in no way linked to each other in any way. And it's this problem that Gopher attempts to solve. Now, admittedly, it's not the only attempt to solve this problem. A number of things start happening all more or less around the same time, including the web. Now, Gopher was created by a team led by Mark McCahill at the University of Minnesota. McCahill and team already had form when it came to inventing useful things for the internet, in that they'd already created Popmail, one of the earliest email clients out there. So this was not their first rodeo. Now, interestingly, to explain what Gopher is, we actually have the original set of slides that Mark Cahill used in 1992 to explain Gopher to his audience. I'll bring them up on the screen. Now, Gopher's a client server model, just like the web, in that a machine somewhere out there on the internet runs a Gopher server, and you have a Gopher client running on your machine that connects to that Gopher server. When it does, it gets handed down the first initial menu screen from the Gopher server. Now, this gives you an idea as to how Gopher is organized. There is essentially a system of menus that eventually lead you to documents or other resource types that you can pull over, say, FTP, for example. And there is a hierarchical structure for these things, including linking off to other Gopher servers. And just as a little note so you can see that Gopher started earlier, Gopher got allocated port 70, where the web got allocated port 80. I should also mention that the Gopher menu, that's all text-based, there's no graphics in here. Your client may display a little graphic next to, say, a menu entry, or a link to a file over FTP, but it's the client that's generating those graphics, they're not coming from the Gopher server. And part of this is so a text-only based client is entirely feasible, as that was still the majority of users on the internet at the time. But there was a growing base of microcomputers and Unix workstations starting to be on the internet, and that was the audience McKay Hill particularly wanted to focus on. But they were clearly aware in order for Gopher to be a success, they still had to support that 
predominantly text audience that was there when they were initially developing Gopher. Now while Gopher can serve you up documents and obviously menus, predominantly it's wrapping other things that are already there like FTP. It's trying to bring some form of structure to all of this and help you navigate and find whatever it is you're actually looking for on the internet. Now you can say that's kind of an overlapping goal with what the web would later go and do as well, which is why Gopher is probably quite so frequently referred to as the web before the web. So how did Gopher come to be? Now, I mentioned it was created earlier by Mark McHale and his team at the University of Minnesota. McHale and team were based in the Shepherd Labs and were part of the microcomputer team for the university. Now, this gave them a degree of freedom. They could just write software and put it out for microcomputers. You didn't need approval from university central IT services to get your application installed on the mainframe. And Gopher was one of their first products to kind of went, well, a bit viral. After much discussion and wrangling, they finally released on an FTP server the first Gopher client and server. And someone put out a Newsnet post introducing this thing. And very quickly, Gopher became something that was soon consuming all their support time, to the point where their little offices started to become known as the Mother Gopher. Now, in various parts of the university administration started to get contacted by people saying, this Gopher thing's great, when are we going to get the new version? That was the first time that people who were in charge of the University of Minnesota had discovered that, well, Gopher was a thing. And within the first year, we'd gone from there being one Gopher server to at least 100. Now, you might be wondering, what's happening with the web during this period? Well, technically, it exists. It exists in CERN, and it only runs on next computers, and at this point in time, is nowhere near as successful as Gopher. But we all know that swaps round. Eventually, the web becomes the thing. So how on earth did that happen? If Gopher's got such a head of steam and is existing at the same time as the web now, but still expanding massively more than the web, there must have been an event that flipped this round, right? Well, yeah, there is. Some of this has got stuff to do with things that happened in the world of the web, and some of this has got things that happened in the world of Gopher. Let's have a look at some of the web things first. Now, initially, one of the things that held it back was that the only web browser in the world was available for Next, a line of Unix workstations created by Steve Jobs, you know, the Apple dude that, while very cool for the time, were not exactly mainstream even in the Unix workstation market, which itself really not very mainstream. So the first really big shift in the world of the web is a new web browser called Mosaic, created by the National Center for Supercomputers. This meant that people had a web browser for something that was not a Next computer, initially mostly Unix boxes, but it would get ported to other non-Unix platforms like VMS and Windows, which was starting to emerge, Mac OS, and of course the Amiga. So this meant it was not just a Next thing. The other big change for the web is why it was all initially text only, with it occasionally allowing you things like slightly bigger text for headlines and things such as bold and italic, or at least or so in, Mosaic gave us the ability to have graphics in line with the text. But the other really big change that really helped move the web forward and get more people onto it, ironically, was Gopher. Most of the talk about the web and the spreading of web browser clients was done via Gopher. The web had another, more popular platform to bootstrap itself from. It didn't have to spread purely by word of mouth like Gopher had to. But you're probably now thinking to yourself, well, something also had to happen in the world of Gopher, and it did. It's probably time to talk about that. Even before Gopher was released, it had not had an easy beginning. When they first presented Gopher to the university committee, it did not go well. In fact, one of the people at the meeting described it as the worst meeting they'd ever seen. He's also quoted as saying, I still remember a woman in pumps jumping up and down screaming, you can't do that. Now, apparently, chief amongst the offenses that Gopher had committed or at least according to that committee, was that it did not involve the mainframe. Its client-server model ran on microcomputers. So, basically, anyone could set it up and use it, and the university's central IT body wasn't in charge of it. Apparently, someone at the meeting rather loudly declared you're not supposed to have done this. And in that meeting, the Gopher team were told they were not to work on this protocol anymore. Did that go down well with the Gopher team? No. Did they continue working on the Gopher protocol? Yes. Apparently, 
after the meeting, Mikhail leaned on the then director of, of the computer center and told him that he would quit if he wasn't allowed to continue working on the coolest thing he'd ever worked on. So apparently the 1991 release of Gopher was in no way sanctioned. They couldn't persuade the university to let them continue working on it, so they released it to the world via an FTP server. I don't think that was something they particularly requested the university to see if they could do. So for Gopher to then become a massive success, and suddenly the administration of the university is getting thanked by people and also requested for improvements of Gopher, a project they thought they cancelled, there wasn't exactly a great working relationship with the team that made Gopher and the rest of the university administration. Despite this rift, Gopher just grew and grew in popularity, with, with servers popping up everywhere, other people starting to write their own Gopher clients and contribute code back to the mother Gopher back at Minnesota. In fact, Gopher was something that the early open source community really got their teeth stuck into. And this is where something bad happens. University's administration finally decides it wants a slice of the Gopher pie and it's going to make some money out of this thing. So the university announces there is going to be a for-profit license attached to GoFats, and that'll be somewhere in the range of hundreds to thousands of dollars based on the size of the institution. And this goes down about as well as you think it's going to. See, at this point, most of the people who'd set up Gopher servers and had started to do their own Gopher stuff, they've been providing quite a lot of the code and also contributing that code back to Minnesota, and now Minnesota wanted to charge them for the stuff that they helped write. Now, one of the Gopher team basically described that as that socially killed Gopher. There were still people installing more Gopher servers, Gopher continued to grow, but amongst that key community that had been the initial sort of viral impetus of Gopher, well, they were now soured on Gopher and they were looking for something else, and the thing that their eyes sort of fell upon was the web. The web had been there in the background all this time, improving bits here and there, but the community who developed a lot of the stuff from the early internet were not that infused by it, at least initially. But with Gopher now being kind of dead to them, whenever they were looking for something new or cool to do, well, they started to focus on doing it on the web. That made it catch more people's attention, and more people started to do stuff with it, which caught more people's attention, and so on and so forth, and suddenly, the web's bigger than Gopher. When you lose your audience, it's really hard to get it back, and as true as that is for, say, I don't know, people on YouTube, it's also true for technology. Once you're no longer the new cool thing, it is quite hard to persuade people to keep using your thing if it hasn't become super well established by that point. You could say, Gopher accidentally got itself cancelled. But Gopher did not just die overnight, it wasn't simply the next big thing and then gone the day afterwards. Even after the event that kind of led to its downfall, the number of Gopher servers out there continued to grow. Even Microsoft, when it finally decided to put its foot into the internet services end of stuff with NT and created its product IIS, they included the Gopher server with that, as well as web and FTP and the other things they had on there. Maybe one of the things that helped make Gopher look like it was fading faster was the sheer explosive growth of the web when we hit the mid-90s. That was the rising star when the public's attention finally turned to the internet. Now, admittedly, the web finally gave them something on the internet that they could understand, which is kind of why public's attention was turning to it, but Gopher also could have been that thing. And that's why many people regard it as nearly the web, because it so could have hit those levels of success. There was nothing technically there to stop it. It's just the timing was off and then the weird licensing situation. Now, admittedly, soon after that, the web would kind of leave Gopher far behind as it would get more and more developed with increasingly sophisticated browsers and web servers and technology like SSL to make it secure. And then on top of that, web services could be developed that, you know, were never going to be capable of happening on Gopher. Like, for example, the thing you're using to watch this video. But parts of the web were also playing catch up. We went a long time without having proper search, for example. So is Gopher dead? Well, the answer sort of yes and no. In terms of that battle of how we view the internet and all the things on it, yeah, that battle is over, the web has won, and all new things seem to be getting built on top of the web, so the web is going nowhere ever. But Gopher's still there. There are still new Gopher clients getting developed. There are new Gopher servers out there. Heck, there are even new projects developing software to be Gopher servers. So why is this happening? What's still appealing about Gopher? Is it just a retro charm thing? I mean, I say that like there's something wrong with that. <laughs> you know, people in glass houses, but I think it is something just a little bit more than that. 
A lot of the people who are using Go for now who have talked about why discuss it addressing fixing some of the problems that the web has developed over time. Generally, the web is an unstructured source of data. Whereas Gopher is not, Gopher generally tends to be organized into a hierarchical structure. The web really developed structure on the basis of search engines, things being able to find stuff. And over time, that search system has got, well, worse and worse. Google are not necessarily interested in giving you the result that closely matches what you're looking for. They're interested in making the most money they can while you are using search. Nobody's making money out of Gopher, so nobody cares. Those setting up Gopher services are just trying to set up the best structure they can. Gopher also still has search directly embedded into it with Veronica 2 these days. But Gopher is also active, you're still the one who is looking, whereas the web has started to become more passive with a number of sites getting nearly all the web traffic out there. We go to our various social media platforms and then we follow the feed. You don't so much request stuff from those websites these days as these websites push to you what you think you might be interested in. It's gone from being an active experience to a passive experience. Whereas Gopher only really does active, you don't have a passive feed system in the world of Gopher. And I can see the appeal in this. With a lot of sites, I prefer not for it just to feed me stuff, but to, for me to actively get what I want from it. So yeah, I can see why the idea of Gopher structure does actually appeal to me. But also, there is that retro thing that I parked earlier. If you're going to start putting out information about retro systems and computers, having an actual retro platform to do it with that's been updated a little bit for security reasons does have an appeal. I can still use the same Gopher client that came with my son Spark Station to access modern Gopher, same with my Amiga. But if I could only access it with retro systems, that would have slightly less appeal. But no, there is a Gopher client for Android, for example, so I can use my phone and my tablet. There are Gopher clients for every modern operating system out there. People like Project Overbyte have given us an extension to Chrome called Burrow, so we can just use Gopher inside Chrome. They also have a web-based proxy, so you can just use Gopher inside a regular browser without any modification, which you can find at floodgap.com. This combination of being well suited to running on retro systems and also modern systems kind of really appeals to me to the point where I've been compiling myself a little gopher container that I can fire up inside a Kubernetes cluster, because why not do this in the most offensively modern way possible? I've been having quite a lot of fun with that. I may even put up a video on the second channel about it at some point. Oh yes, they have a second channel. Uh, link in the description below. It's where I do follow-up videos to the main one. I also do videos occasionally on the odd side project that I don't think makes a great history video, or the odd one just talking about the channel in general and stuff happening in the background. I release stuff on there as and when I kind of have something I want to put out there but don't want to put it on the main channel because I don't think it's what most of you are subscribing for. Well, if you got all the way to the end, I'd like to say thank you very much for watching. Hopefully you've enjoyed learning about the history of Gopher, how it came to be and what it is, and also now you know what a mother Gopher is. I also have a brief parish notice as well. I'm going to mention that there's a Discord server now. Yes, if you want to come chat to me and other like-minded nerds, Lee from More Fun Making It was kind enough to set up a Discord and then invited us other YouTubers to come be part of it. So, yes, if you want to be part of it too, link in the description below. If you enjoyed this video, there is a button that's there to indicate that fact, and if you didn't, well, there is another button. If you would really like to help the channel out, why not hit the subscribe button? Because it actually makes YouTube tell people that these videos exist.